Hi, this is Pete Stanford here with uh, another receiver um, of Vintage Years. And uh, this particular receiver is a UR27. Uh, it's the uh, low band AM, VHF that is, airband receiver as used by the United States Navy. Um, this one's probably about a 19, early 1950s, 52, 53 vintage. So again, she's uh, 70 years old this year. Um, it actually is part of a series of receivers that they had used on shipboard, which um, started, I think, with a UR13, which was the uh, the 400 megahertz uh, version. Um, then they had this come out as the VHF version, um, and then they had a much later one, uh, which is URR35. Mm -hmm. um, and then the differences are the um, obviously other than frequencies is that this is fundamentally a single single stage single single down converting superhead. Um, the IF is at about 18.6 megahertz. And uh, on the left-hand side here is a uh, down-converting, tunable down-converting assembly. And uh, you'll see the setup for 400 megs or for VHF at uh, 108 to 190. This actually goes up, which is quite a, a wide range, much wider than I uh, would have expected. But anyway, um, I've had this set probably 18 months, two years now. Um, tinkered with it a bit, had a lot of problems. Um, the previous owner had tried to power the unit through the audio output, uh, taken out the audio output, but in doing so, um, it had been on for some time because there was a lot of oxidization charring in the back assembly where there are some uh, RF filtering, RF filters. There's a couple of um, Litz wire, multi part, what they call pie um, type uh, stacked inductors. Uh, and they were completely fried out, um, and so fried out that the the carbon of them had gotten into the set, um, and uh, <laughs> of all things, got onto the ceramic standoffs on the IF coils, and consequently the AGC, which is fed through that, for through the same coils, um, uh, just just were going to ground virtually. That there was 200k to ground, and we're looking for like a three meg feed on these things. So um, that was a a labour of life taking out each of the IF coils, cleaning them, um, putting them through a, uh, a bath and um, cleaning them, drying them off, make sure that they were, you know, tens of megs to ensure that uh, it, it's, it's ironic you could actually put a, a, a uh, of an ohmmeter on the, the ceramic base and you could actually me measure across ceramic. It was, I should have taken a photograph of it. Um, and it was also impregnated with some sort of carbon film across it and it was, it was quite bad. Uh, that notwithstanding, um, there were two of the uh, the tube sockets completely removed with all the tube, you know, tubes gone, uh, wiring just left hanging. Somebody had a go, I guess, maybe making an FM uh, FM detector in there, perhaps. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what was going on there. So uh, that was also a, a problem. And then there were some, obviously, uh, usual faults. Um, basically, rebuilt the back-end filtering system fitted a whole new audio transforming system for, for 600 ohms, um, rebuilt the two tube sockets and uh, uh, got it running. Uh, the audio was then a bit, um, uh, how can I put it, a bit distorted. And uh, one of the, uh, after much going around, I think it was still an AGC problem because that's where the, the original issue was. Uh, it turned out to be the audio uh, bandpass filter. They have a filter in here similar to the 390, which covers 300 hertz to 3.5 kilohertz. Um, and they apply HT to a valve uh, and tap straight off the top of the HT into that filter. And what was happening is it was um, it was leaky. That's off the, the the internal capacitor was leaky, and it was pulling down the HT down to about 18 volts on top of the uh, on top of the plate for that audio stage. And uh, obviously under any sort of audio drive, it was just it was just heavily you know, distorted. So I basically put a block in DC uh, capacitor in there, and uh, it all came good. So we currently have the unit tuning around. Um, just a quick tour of the front panel. You've got two little doors, each side will come to those. There's a, a main tuning system here, which is pretty coarse. Um, I think the real main aim of this here was you'd have a crystal and uh, you would pop the crystal in for the frequency you want. Uh, you'd tune it as if you would uh, pre-select it to the right frequency and it'd be set and forget. Um, there is a, a, a fallback solution here. Maybe the crystal fails. Maybe you want a frequency that you don't have a crystal for. Um, you can... Um, switch it between uh, a, a you know, internal uh, and a crystal so or a manual and a crystal and uh, here you can see that uh, someone's actually removed the crystal holder and just fitted a BNC and again I suspect that was just to inject um, 
be able to inject a VCO externally, to be honest. Um, I've not tried it, but I suspect that's what it was all about. Um, I've, once I've got it going, I'm just happy with the internal VCO. It seems to run quite well. Uh, I've gone through the uh, the deck. Has some interesting, the the the, the input um, down converting for one of better words. You know, the, the first stage there uh, has some very interesting trombone inductors um, on a ceramic ceramic bar is the best I can describe this. I've um, never seen it described before. We've seen it, even in even in drawings, it's hard to work out. But essentially, there's a uh, an inductor wound on a uh, ceramic um, former. And, and that in turn has an upper ceramic bar across it. And uh, where the inductor is standing off, the two standoffs are actually a trombone circuit. So you can actually adjust a nut, uh, well, basically a bolt screw, which will just nut one end. You adjust the, the screw and this whole inductor moves up and down a, a trombone uh, and therefore gives you the, the extra reduction in inductance needed to uh, bring the, uh, the, that, that particular tune circuit on the scale. There's a few of those. Um, and I noticed cracks on a few of them, um, not from me, but from previous uh, users. And these trombones are quite stiff, so uh, I didn't play around with them too much. But arguably, it seems to be doing very well without them. Um, the recovered order is quite good, quite quite happy with it. Um, so there's the crystal or manual selection. Uh, there's also something up here called uh, um, receive or align. And that's to do with, I think, setting up the crystal. Once you put the crystal in, move to align. You tune it up until to maximum smoke on meter. And then, uh, well, you know you're there, put it back to receive. So that's the, I don't really go into that side of it very much. Uh, across the bottom, obviously, the main tuning dial. There's a lock for the tuning here, which is a compression lock and a, um, a, a, a thin disc behind, which rotates with the main tuning dial. Um, here is, I'm trying to look at this is now. Um, <laughs> oh, this is sort of just a dimmer. This is dimmer for light. There's a, a backlight to the frequency readout and it allows you to dim it. Um, never really touched that. Um, there's something called a silencer, which is really just the, um, the well, basically a squelch circuit. Um, it's got a diode in there, which literally is in series. And it's either uh, you know, switched on to allow the, uh, the audio through or you know, reverse DMF and uh, uh, it's switched off. So you can't you know, get it. And it gives a reasonably good on off, you know, good 40, 50 dB of. Um, of silencing, so it's it's it seems to work quite well, and that's set and uh, and triggered by the RF level out of the uh, of the ABC uh, detector diodes. Uh, there's a, an audio monitoring pot adjustment here, so this is for the 600 ohm to your headphone set to have a look out here. Uh, obviously, you power on off, and in the the right hand window, uh, we've got obviously a couple of the you know, HT and and and. These, and um, and uh, goodness, HT and I think it's a spare to just to be honest. The other one, um, we've got noise limiter, which is again it just takes the peaks out of the the signal, makes it a little bit harsh, um, and will take out any um, periodic sort of pulsed you know, interference. Uh, and at the bottom, we've got the basically the squelch threshold setting, the silencer, and then we've got the main audio output pot which is adjusting the, the back audio output, the, the 600 ohm, which would normally go off to your, your matrix there to, uh, to various places. So uh, that's the, the quick tour. You can see the thing going off in the background here. I've got it turned down at the moment. So it's a Saturday evening. And I'll just have a... Good evening, uh, descend, fire starts at 9,000, QNH 1019. Quite, quite nice audio. Descend, fire start, 9,000, QNH 1019, And what we have here is a, basically an indicator of the signal level coming in versus the audio output here. And, uh, Henry 1 for signal scenery, click direct to Betso and cancel the start speed restrictions. Click direct Betso and cancel the start speed so what I've got here is it just coming through, volume turned up near max really, and this adjusted back. So we're getting close to the 600 ohm. This is a 10k pot, so and it's largely across the 600 ohm line. So if we get to the max from there with the 600 ohm input to the speaker above, um, which is the uh, an LS474, um, pretty nice sounding speaker actually. This is the one I, I picked up um, again a couple of years ago, uh, mainly just giving that 600 ohms to 3 ohm um, conversion, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it seems very nice. Anyway, so going back to the, uh, the receiver itself, um, it tunes across generally the, the main airband okay. In fact, I'll just tune it through, see if anything else pops up. There'll be a, um, 
I did like this here somewhere. Three, yeah. one, zero knots. Cavalcade. So that's the Brisbaneitis, which is um, perpetually transmitting 24. On first contact yeah, with Brisbane uh, ground with the weather approach. and the settings are. So I'll just turn down a little bit in case it's overdriving the... Uh, Time zero eight four and as we go down, we may see some of the... Yeah. Now, the readout is also very coarse. Um, I mean, I know from monitoring the, uh, the, you know, the frequencies uh, over the years, roughly where all the, the, the approaches, the departures, the towers and the, uh, the ATSs are. And uh, so once I see it, like, it does make sense. I mean, when you see where it, when it finally rests, and although the, uh, the vertical bar is missing off this, um, you can you know, visualise where it is. Um, it does seem pretty pretty close to where, you know, 124.7, for instance, would be, or 121. Point, sorry, I'm trying to do this, 121.0 and also 118. No, there's nothing there. Progress. That's the ATIS again. That'll be 125.7 or 0.6. Again. It's hard to work out between the two because it's a little bit coarse. But um, I, I, I would open it up. Um, the problem being that when I finally put it to assemble, you know, assemble assembles together, there are two blind mateable coaxial connectors on it. One for the uh, what they call the scan output, and one for the RF, um, you know, the, uh, the the antenna. And uh, I noticed the RF one, the the inner section was very the, the center pin. It was so tight that when I Opened it up. It pulled out the. It pulled out the whole inner section, and uh, when I put it back together again, I made sure it was all seated. So I've opened it again. I'm going to go through that. Ultimately, that's probably going to going to fail. So uh, I, I'm, I'm resisting opening it up anymore until, uh, well, until ever. I think <laughs> um, the unit probably weighs. Um, I don't know, I think it probably says on the top there about 40, 50 pounds, I'd guess. Um, and it's it's one of I've liked the look of um, the, the U.S. Navy have this traditional look. Certainly in the fifties, you know, with the uh, even the R ten fifty one B has got that similar styling. It's this rounded bolt on you know brick, um, obviously intended not to rely on the rack giving its protection. It's got a, a chassis it sits in. It slides in and out of that chassis, and as long as the chassis is bolted to a frame, you know, the usual computer frame, computer frame at the time. Um, then that's good and you just make directly to the back of the unit um, all the connections necessary um, I presume for maintenance and uh, taking up minimum space on board ship it was probably uh, the way things were basically done at those days so anyway I only wanted to do a short 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 uh, show and tell um, it's say it does seem to work quite well um, it does go through the bands uh, it does do slope detection to a certain degree in fact I'll there's a I think lost sight of it there. It's not that strong, but... That's a local uh, community radio station for Vietnamese. And uh, as with any aim detector, you can go off onto one side and what will do with the slope detection. And it goes all the way through and you can hear the various you know, data signals and... Uh, You'll find that there's three TV channels and the noise just lifts like a plateau there. So that's uh, the first DV TV. Then there'll be a gap. I'm sort of tuning up and it starts again. So there's a, a gap in between them, the next one. And there'll be another gap and then the next one. So those are the three uh, digital TV VHF channels that we have here locally. And now it goes back down into the... Uh, the usual FM narrowband. And we'll go all the way down to. Just a 74, DC 9000 via Star, QNH 1019. Let's peak the audio. Anyway, <laughs> audio is very crisp. Uh, I quite like it. Um, I've had it running. <laughs> I've had it running for uh, a couple of days non-stop. Um, I was trying to see if the fan, there's an internal blower fan, would cut on. It just didn't. I guess I don't know what triggers it. It appears to be like a thermal, uh, biothermal strip in there. 
but um, obviously never got to the temperature to pull it over. It's been cold actually this last uh, week. One, two, three, that's more five. So we'll see, you should be sort of here. Yes. Although we can't hear the ground. Oh, he might be going to Gold Coast. Not quite sure what one, two, three, decimal five is. Okay, again, I'll finish off on that. And uh, would I would I do another one? Probably not. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, there's a lot going on in there. It's very well manufactured, very well made, built like a battleship inside. Um, everything is bolted down and tethered, um, quite nicely laid out, easy to, to work through. Um, you know, 1952, we're talking here, you know, seven years after World War II, uh, and here we have a VHF and a UHF version of a, a much higher calibre than was available in, um, in the 1940s. So it's, uh, it was a step in the right direction, obviously, over the years, you know, things have got better with solid state, but uh, it does give a good account of itself. Um, quite impressed with it. Anyway, that'll be for this, enough for today.